The year was 2012, and I found myself feeling pretty low. I just preached a message that I poured my heart and soul into, and the feedback that I received at the time from several respected individuals made it sound like I should never preach another sermon in my life. In fact, based on my track record at the time of having been asked to speak a total of once in the span of three whole years, I had gotten to the point where I thought I just need to throw out the preaching, the idea of preaching altogether. Fast forward to today. Of all the things that I get to do in life, preaching writing sermons, brainstorming and developing new series ideas and helping others grow as preachers remain some of my favorite things that I get to do in life. So clearly something's changed, but what? Hold that thought. Please turn with me to Philippians chapter two. Philippians two, we'll be looking at verses 19 through 24 this morning, starting now with verse 19. The Apostle Paul is writing, he says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because, watch this, As a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me, and I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. He writes, as a son with his father. Today, we're going to speak and look at the subject of spiritual parenthood. Spiritual fatherhood, spiritual motherhood, if those terms are unfamiliar, think of this as spiritual mentoring. Now, I've got to tell you, when we got together as a preaching team last year to start mapping out the different series of series that we would go through in this little book called Philippians, we never dreamed that the weeks would align in such a way that on Father's Day of all days, we'd end up preaching a message on spiritual parenthood like this one. But here we we go, there we have it. We may not have been smart enough to plan ahead like that, but I'm, it's just a reminder to me that we serve a God who doesn't let even the tiniest moments slip by. If only we'd have eyes to see and ears to hear. I found myself in such a moment like this on Tuesday afternoon. I was in a room full of people, pastors, entrepreneurs, business leaders, movement leaders, and we were all gathered together to discuss a single subject. Can you guess what? (laughs) Spiritual parenthood. Like of all the possible things that we could have talked about, for some reason, that's what was on the agenda. And then one by one, we went around the room and each person there started to highlight an example of at least one key mentor who helped them get to where they are today. And as we're doing so, it dawns on me, if not for spiritual mentors, that room would have been empty. If not for spiritual mothers and fathers in the faith who take time to invest, to believe, to encourage and challenge us to be all that God has made us to be, those ministries, those businesses, those neighborhoods and cities would have suffered and possibly not even exist. This subject matters. And God has been getting my attention lately on the importance of it. And so I cannot wait to talk to you about this this morning. We're going to look at the marks of a spiritual child, the marks of a spiritual parent. And then we're going to consider together what are the the few practical next steps that we can each take in our own journeys of faith. So when it comes to spiritual mentoring, the spiritual child in the relationship is called to do one thing, to demonstrate to demonstrate. I'll show you what I mean. Starting now with verse 20. I have, look at this, no one else like him. Paul's saying this guy, Timothy stands out. 
Why? Because he shows genuine concern for your welfare, for your well-being, meaning this guy cares about other people. Paul then adds, for everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. He's like, listen, most everybody out there is looking out for number one. Not our boy Timothy. No, no, no. He's got an audience of one in mind, and that's Jesus. And then Paul wraps it all up by saying, but you know that Timothy's proven himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. Let's map this out. Spiritual children demonstrate exemplary living. By that, I mean, they stand out as an example. Spiritual children demonstrate genuine concern for others, not just themselves. Aware, they have also an awareness of Jesus's interests, not just their own interests. Spiritual children demonstrate proven faithfulness over the course of time. And finally, spiritual children demonstrate a willingness to serve alongside in the work of the gospel. These are just a few marks of spiritual children right here in our text, whether a son or a daughter in the faith. But I want you to see these marks at least their potential, were present in Timothy even before Paul ever got a hold of him. We're going to back it up to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. Look at verses 1 and 2 with me. Paul came to Derbe and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of Timothy. Now this is Paul and Timothy's first interaction with one another. And I love how it describes Timothy. He's got a mom who loves Jesus. And apparently the other Christians in the area all recognize the character of this young man so much so that it says that they spoke well of him. And so naturally Paul goes, hey, he takes notice. And then it says in verse three, Paul wanted to take him along on the journey. Paul's noticed this guy. He wants to take him on the journey with him. And then it says, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew his father was a Greek. Now that's a little awkward, but I I think Paul just wanted to see if Timothy was willing to get some skin in the game. Um, Some of you will catch that one later. Verse four. As they traveled from town to town, it says the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. Here we find Timothy choosing to serve alongside Paul. But did you catch it? Verse three again, it says Paul wanted to take him along. Paul wanted to take him along. Spiritual children demonstrate, but spiritual parents initiate. Spiritual parents initiate the relationship. Tim didn't need to come up to Paul and say, hey, please notice me, take notice, take me with you. Like he wasn't doing that, right? No, Paul, it says, had the want to. Paul, as the spiritual parent, made the choice. Tim, I see potential in you. Others have acknowledged it. You've demonstrated it all along. Now I want you to join me in this work and I'm gonna pour myself into you so you can be all God has called you to be. We know this from other places in scripture, but this relationship between the two of them was a very special one. Two books of the Bible, 1 and 2 Timothy, are are letters written by Paul to this young protege uh, as he would take on the challenge of shepherding a congregation of his own. So eventually Tim is going to become the lead, as it were, and Paul is going to be on the sidelines cheering cheering him on from a distance. But I love how it starts. It starts with Paul inviting Timothy to serve alongside Paul in the work. And and I just love this, because why else do you think Paul would say, hey, guys, I'm sending Timothy to you in Philippi because he cares for you. Why would he say that? Well, I believe it's because there was some relational history between Timothy and the Philippians. See, a few verses later in Acts chapter 16, 
Paul ends up in Philippi and he meets an entrepreneur named Lydia, a a demon-possessed girl and a jailer who all end up becoming the very first Christians in Philippi that likely all are still in that church in Philippi when Paul is writing this letter to them. And I believe there's enough evidence to, to suggest that Timothy would have been there tagging along with Paul in those first encounters in Acts chapter 16, even if he's just behind the scenes a little bit. And I say that because of the very first verse in Philippians. Let's see if you remember it. Look at whose name is included here. Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul and, who does it say? This was written by Paul and Timothy to the church in Philippi. See, this letter wasn't simply written by Paul. Timothy was in on it too. So why would that matter? I think it's because the first Christians in Philippi and these Christians here in Philippi would have already known Timothy from that very first trip all those years before. All this took place because of this twofold reality. Paul, as a spiritual father, initiating the relationship as he observed Timothy as a spiritual son, demonstrating faithfulness. Spiritual parents initiate, spiritual children demonstrate, and the church and the world are blessed. But can I tell you the phrase that struck me in a new way as I was preparing for this morning? It's Philippians 2, once more, specifically verse 20. Paul says, I have No one else like him. No one else like him. Here's Paul. He's writing from prison and he wants to ensure that this church is taken care of in his absence. And so he says, I'm going to send someone to you, someone to encourage you and strengthen you. And he goes so far as to say, I've got no one else in my life like him. Wow. No one who's proven himself like Timothy. No one whose care for you is as genuine as Timothy. No one whose interests are so fixated on the cross of Christ as Timothy. Paul says, of all the people I know, of all the Christians that I have ever met, there is only one person I would think to trust with this task. I was talking with my wife, Grace, about this, and she asked a very sobering question. Check this out. She said, if Paul could say that, then what's that say about the state of the church? If we're not fighting tooth and nail to be a church of Timothy's, would Paul ever make the same statement about any of us? Sobering. Imagine this. Imagine for a second that Pastor Jeff is sitting in his office and he gets a phone call. I always do this as a phone call because it's like a flip phone because I still think flip phones are a thing. Someone's in need. Let's say some shelters in a country like Taiwan or Myanmar. Or how about a church a little closer by like in Mexico? They reach out to Jeff and as Jeff is being presented the need at this time, Pastor Jeff says, oh, I know who to send, someone faithful, someone genuine, someone who loves Jesus more than anything else in this world. I'm going to send, and then he names your name. How empowering would that be? How encouraging? And so let me ask, would he? Honestly assess, would Pastor Jeff think to say your name? Would he think to say my name? Are you and I continuously known for demonstrating concern for the things of Christ and not our own? Because hear me, it's not just Mexico reaching out. And it's not just Togo and Taiwan or Myanmar and beyond. No, no, no. Garden City is reaching out. Harrisonville is reaching out. 
Adrian is reaching out. Peculiar is reaching out. Lee Summit is reaching out. And Latour and East Lynn and the Power and Light District and Westport and Honeywell and Burns and McDonald and Children's Mercy Hospital and, and, and all of these places. Every town and neighborhood, every school and street corner, they are all reaching out. And someone greater than Pastor Jeff, someone even greater than the Apostle Paul is saying, who will I send? Who will go for us? I'm talking about God. God, the creator, God, Lord of heaven and earth, creator, maker, and sustainer of all that there was and is and ever will be. He is right now saying, I've heard the cries of this broken world. I feel the aches and the pains of this creation groaning and my vehicle of choice to send and bring my glorious good news to this world is you. Realize this, every Sunday when we come together in this way, it's not simply to absorb and then move on as if nothing ever happened. Every Sunday when a church comes together like this, really in any way, whether it's life teams or coaching groups or salad suppers and garden parties, like the purpose, there's one purpose, to fill us up and then send us out into every place God has placed us. Because there's someone even more strategic than Pastor Jeff who's choosing us for this work. And he's choosing us He's not choosing Pastor Jeff. He's not choosing Billy Graham. He's choosing you in your workplace, in your school, in your home. It's like if God is thinking to himself, there is no one better suited for this task than you. And he's sending you each Monday into that place. What are we going to do with that? Like, is anyone else feeling the pressure right now? It seems to me that if God is up to this, if this is what he's doing, then it's time we take spiritual mentoring seriously. Because otherwise, we're going to find that the church is weak and the world is in need. And Christ's promise to redeem and restore the cosmos is going to be utterly anemic and ineffective. And I am not down for making Jesus a liar. How about you? But when spiritual parents initiate and spiritual children demonstrate, the church and the world are blessed. So what are we to do with this? If you're a Timothy today, Young in your faith and your walk, then your call is simply to serve right where you are. It helps to serve in in a place that's with the grain of your giftings. By that I mean your personality. Are you more introverted, extroverted? By that I mean, are you more of a teacher or more of a servant? All these different ways that we can serve. If you have no idea what that means or what your gifts or skills or passions are, shoot me an email or talk to me today. My email is peter at heartoflife.org and it is like my favorite conversation in the world to help people discover what God has created them to do. So talk to me, peter at heartoflife.org and I will try to help connect you somewhere in line with your giftings. But for the purposes of application today, I want to talk specifically to the Pauls here. I want to talk to the ones who are older in their faith. And by that, I simply mean you may just be one step ahead of somebody else that you're supposed to bring with you and help move them to their next level. Why? Because Paul's initiate. Spiritual parents initiate. So how do we do that? Well, if you're looking to meaningfully pour into someone else's life, I admit it can be a little bit overwhelming. So I have found a helpful place to start is this acronym AIM, A-I-M, AIM. And it helps to identify who to pour into and then also how. So you're going to want to write this down if you haven't or if you've got a photographic memory, we're jealous of you, fine. But otherwise, write this down. The A in AIM stands for 
awareness. Awareness. Before you and I can effectively mentor somebody, we must become aware of who God has placed around us. So whether it's in our church or from your workplace or in your family or neighborhood, here's the homework for today and this week. I want you to take time to pray and ask God to bring to mind at least five names of people in your life who are younger in the faith than you are. Write a list this week, start today, of up to f- of at least five names of people who are younger in the faith than you are. Here are some questions that may help you consider this. Who seems to cross your path often? Who does God keep bringing to your attention even when they're not around? Who do you find yourself drawn toward when you're with them? This week, again, pray and write out at least five names of people who are at least one step behind you in their faith. That's A, awareness. Next, I is for intentionality. Intentionality. This is about making an intentional effort to get to know the people on your list. So begin praying for them regularly. Ask them to hang out, reach out and grab coffee together or lunch. And as you become aware of those around you, begin taking these intentional steps to build that relationship. And then, it's not quite done yet, and then I want you to notice whether or not that individual is beginning to take intentional steps toward you. See, that's the key. It's not just uh, that, that I pour in and pour in. No, if there's no reciprocal relationship, if there's no uh, giving back in that relationship, it may mean that they're not ready to, to, to go into this level of relationship. Because again, what this is going to do is it's going to take your group of, of five names and it's going to start to whittle it down to eventually one or two. Because you want to be sure that we're putting our time where it's going to be received and, and, um, and it's going to manifest. Now, again, I'm not saying you cross them out of your life. If for some reason you don't see that reciprocal relationship building, that's okay. What I am saying is be wise with your time. Because sometimes people are not ready for that change. And that's okay. They may not be ready yet. They may be ready in two years. So you keep them in your life. But it may not be that you're going to spend once a week meeting together or whatever the frequency is that you need to do this. This doesn't make them bad people. That's not what I'm trying to say. But if they are not ready to walk that road of discipleship, it's better to invest your time somewhere else. Because the reality is, as much as we want to, we cannot be everything for everyone. But we can be everything for someone. Can we be sure that we're investing when the ground is ready? That's intentionality. Lastly, M. M is margin. Margin. As you begin taking steps toward others and they respond by taking steps toward you, it's time to create some margin in our lives, to integrate them into our way of living. See, margin is about creating space in one of two ways, or in two ways, space in your time, but also space in your task. I'll explain. Space in your time means cutting out something to make time for something else. Some of us are unable to regularly invest in other people because we're too busy doing things that don't matter. And I'm not going to list them for you. You know exactly what it is. That th- the three things that you're like, oh, I should stop playing that game or I should stop watching that show. Whatever it is that came to your mind when I say cutting things that don't matter in the span of eternity, that's what needs to get crossed off the list. Margin makes space in our time, but also it makes space in our task because some of us are really busy. And we're really busy doing really good things and our plates are full and we're unable to just shift things around and cut them out. That's okay. What we can do instead is invite someone from our list into that task with us. So rather than setting aside a couple hours each week for something like coffee or lunch, you can make space in your tasks. What I mean by that is what do you have to do that you can also invite someone to do with you. Real life example. My first mentor in Kansas City did not have time to mentor me. 
Like, that's kind of funny, right? I, I, I reached out to this guy. I said, hey, would you mentor me as a worship leader? I want to grow under your tutelage. I want to learn from you. And he said he really wished he could, but he didn't have the time or margin right now. And I was pretty bummed. But then he followed up and he said, but here's the thing. And he taught me such a valuable lesson in mentoring right here. He said, here's the thing. I've got to build a playground for my daughters later this week. Do you want to join me? What followed were several hours of working together. And while setting up this playground for his kids, we were able to talk along the way about everything from our life stories to our aspirations to how to lead worship and everything in between. And I ended up leaving that one meeting, that one conversation with four books that I then went to, to read all on the subject of leading worship that have all shaped how I lead and also how I train others to lead worship to this day. And it was all because he identified something ordinary that he was going to do alone. And he said, what if we did it together? What is something that you ordinarily do by yourself that you can invite someone else to join you in? Got to do some yard work. How about watch a movie? Maybe set your kids to bed or go for a walk or eat a meal. Maybe you need to go shopping or you need to swing through the DMV. Like these are all, what about a road trip, right? five hours in the road to go pick up some doors or something and come back. Like this is a perfect opportunity to bring someone with you. Or how about this? You're trying to study the Bible in the early morning and you've got young kids and they're pestering you. What if instead of seeing them as a nuisance, you use that as an opportunity to bring them in and teach them how to study the word too. Like all of these are opportunities to invite someone into the task. So if you're serious about making, about investing yourself in someone else that might be a couple steps behind you, it starts by taking aim. Become aware, be intentional, and create margin. Now, as we're talking through this, maybe you're thinking, so wait, you want me to invest in just one person? Like what good is one person going to do? And listen, I get it, because I often slip into the kind of thinking that says, I want to reach the thousands like the Apostle Peter did on Pentecost, right? Talk about a rush. <laughs> but then you've got this other Apostle, Andrew, who through all the gospel accounts, it says he brought one person to Jesus. And you're like, this guy, Peter, Andrew. Well, look at how John 1 tells the story. Verse 41, the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother and tell him, we have found the Messiah, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. On the day of Pentecost alone, the apostle Peter brought 3,000 to Christ. And Andrew, in all of his years of ministry up until that point combined, only brought one. But that one was Peter. We cannot underestimate the role of spiritually mentoring a single person. The potential impact is absolutely unparalleled. Instead of craving the thousands, what if we learn to identify the one? Maybe that's the question we should leave with today. Who is your one? Who's your one? See, I thank God for the Pauls and the Andrews in my life who have poured into me, who have pulled me aside from time to time and said, I see God doing something in you and I wanna come alongside and nurture that. And I also praise God for the Timothys and the Peters that God has allowed me to come alongside and pour into them who I'm telling you are gonna take this gospel further than I ever could. Personal story, and then we'll close with this. I told you earlier about how deflated I felt 10 years ago, 2012, um, after preaching a sermon that wasn't received very well. Like I said, something changed. So you may not know this, but I have a sermon podcast now that has on it nearly every sermon I've ever preached 
for the last five years or so. And it's accessible through iTunes and Spotify and those kinds of things to, to anyone in the world who wants to listen to it. In preparation for today's message, I decided, let me take a look and see the stats of what kind of impact it's had. Here are three quick shots. <clears throat> this is where <clears throat> all around the country, people are listening to these sermons. See, not just here in Kansas City, but I've got some family in the East Coast, so it made sense that there would be some representation here in New York and stuff. But apparently it's gone to the West Coast too and, and everywhere in between. And, as, and, and, and what's nuts to me, like, and those little numbers in the dots are all the different like number of downloads. So this has 5,309 downloads in the Kansas City area. And this has, five, I, I was just blown away as I'm thinking about this because the majority of these sermons I preached in a room with less than 50 people there. And so I'm just overwhelmed seeing this. And then I zoomed out. And I realized that it's gone global. People are listening in South America, all three of them. <laughs> People are listening in, in Europe, in Asia, in, in Africa, in Australia, in the Middle East. I started to, to take a look at where there are some tuning in. Apparently there's like thousands tuning in from Japan. I don't know who's in Japan, but apparently they know about me and it's the craziest thing. But what was astonishing to me, uh, we've got the Middle East, there, there's, there's over a hundred in the Middle East. And I went and I asked my cousin who lives in Lebanon, uh, you know, where do you think this is located? Cause I can pinpoint like what neighborhood or street the downloads are coming from. And she goes, oh, Peter, those are the Muslim districts in Lebanon. Like what? And then you start adding up all those numbers together and the tally as of Wednesday of last week, the tally from last week was 23,785 sermon downloads and streams. <clears throat> 23,784 times God's word has been multiplied like bread and fish in the hearts of his children and those who don't yet know him. What in the world? See, I always felt like I was supposed to preach. From a very young age, it was like I had this sense that all I wanted to do was to talk about Jesus. But it seemed like no matter how hard I tried, no matter how much I wanted to do it, I got so little response or affirmation from others that made me think I really should. And it always seemed like I was doing it wrong or I was too hard to understand or I've got all these ideas and passion, but no one really knows how to follow me or whatever it is, something wrong with me. And then 10 years ago, in this moment, as I'm questioning whether or not I should throw in the towel, in enters a man by the name of Pastor Jeff Thunderberg. And despite my poor track record up until that time, he saw something in me that he wanted to help grow. And he willingly invested his time and his energy and his reputation, all of it, to the point that I can say without hesitation that I am the preacher I am today, for better or worse, because of his continued investment, even until now. See, Jeff went all in. He went all in. I guess you could say he took a bit of a gamble, don't you think? Because to invest his time and his skills on somebody others thought, man, he can't speak. Like that's a risk. And I'm sure at some point, Jeff will never admit it, but at some point he has to say, this guy, others don't think he can do it. Why should I bother? He had to have thought that. But he risked. He went all in and he leveraged his time and his resources. And now look, people all around the world have heard the word nearly 24,000 times more than they would have otherwise. And those nearly 24,000 sermon downloads are 24,000 jewels in the, the crown that Jeff is gonna cast one day at the feet of Jesus. All because he was willing to go all in when it came to spiritual mentoring. And what I want you to see is this is not to my credit. And this is not even to Jeff's credit. 
This is the plan God has given us all to put into action. See, we're going to talk some more next week about what a life of all in looks like. But what I want you to see this morning is that nobody gets all in by themselves. No one gets all in by themselves. It takes spiritual mentoring. And so who's around you? Is there somebody who's even just two steps behind that you're ready to take the plunge with? Let's pray to become aware. Let's take those intentional steps and watch if they reciprocate and then create margin in our time and in our task. And then can you imagine what are the stories we will be able to tell when God gets a hold of our hearts and we go all in together? So who's your one? Let me pray for you. Father, you are good. You are so good. And this morning, I just find myself overwhelmed with joy as I consider what you have done. Lord, it's been said, we overestimate what we can accomplish in one year, but we underestimate what can be done in 10. And while I know that to be true of what we can do in 10, Lord, what can you do in 10 years? Give us eyes to see even now. Help us to know this week. Lord, would every single person in this room leave this place with with this three-part action plan, Lord, that we would become aware with your eyes to see those around us, that we would take those intentional steps and watch if that intentionality is returned. And then finally, God, would we create margin in our time and in our task? And would we see a generation rise up, a generation of men and women of boys and girls who love you above all else. God, this is only a work you can accomplish. And it's something you've been doing for thousands of years. And so we just want to join you in it. But I pray that your Holy Spirit would fill us to do this good work. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.